Welcome to the last day of the 2021 PFC conference. The theme for today is philanthropy and the common good, renewing our practices, strengthening our impact. My name is Ina Gutium. I'm one of the PFC board members and also VP at Ontario Trail and Foundation. It is my pleasure to be on C for today. It is my honor to start with the land acknowledgement first. We gather on the ancestral lands and waters of our all indigenous peoples who have left their footprints on Mother Earth before us. We respectfully acknowledge those who have walked on it, those who walk on it now, and the future generations who have yet to walk upon it. I'm joining you today from Treaty 13 lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This is also the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat and the Haudenosaunee people. As a first generation settler on this land, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to call this land my home. We'd love to see who is here today. Unfortunately, we cannot be in person to feel the excitement and energy in the room. The next best thing that we could do is to all put our cameras on, those of you who of course feel comfortable, so that we could see all the lovely faces, we could see the excitement in the room. Today, we have an exciting lineup of sessions. First, philanthropy and democracy, reimagining the information ecosystem landscape, a journey for funders, the connection between personal inner well being and social change. And last but not least, we'll end the day on reflecting on what's next for philanthropy. Today's first session is philanthropy and democracy, reimagining the information ecosystem landscape. This topic is near and dear to my heart. Back when I was starting my career, I did work to uh, promote, or I worked on e-democracy initiatives. And as you can imagine, I'm really excited to join the session. Our speakers today will be inviting us to reflect on what role can philanthropy play in creating a more inclusive narrative? I'm pleased to pass it on to the session moderator, Chad Lubelski from McConnell Foundation. Enjoy the session, everyone. Chad, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Ina, and hi, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, very happy to be here today. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganahage Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which some of us are gathering today. Uh, Chachake or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. That's where I am today. And today it's home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. And I too, uh, similar to you, am a first generation settler on this land, and I'm extremely uh, grateful and appreciative to, to be here. So we have a, a very exciting session today. And uh, I'm going to start, I want to quickly provide an overview of the session, and then I'll just provide a bit of context. So our plan, and you know, we'll see how it unfolds, it probably won't unfold exactly as planned, but this is their intention. Uh, is that each panelist will have about five minutes to speak about their work. And we're very lucky today to have uh, five minutes on local, then on national, and then on international. Then we're going to have a Q&A with the audience, which will be in the chat. Um, then each panelist will have about five minutes to speak about the role of philanthropy and helping them achieve their goals. And then we'll end with another Q&A and then any closing thoughts. But we'll be together for about an hour and 10 minutes or so. And so for those of you like me who are in uh, in the Eastern time zone, thank you for joining us in the lunchtime. Uh, if you're out west, thank you so much for joining us first thing. And if you're on the East Coast, uh, we hope your day is going well. So uh, why this session? Um, I think that there's a, a number of reasons that PFC uh, put together this session, and I just want to really identify two. And one is that research strongly demonstrates the link between a healthy information ecosystem and a healthy democracy. And so what do we mean by a healthy information ecosystem? Well, there's multiple definitions, but essentially accurate, fact-based, trusted information is critical to the health of any community. Individuals need information to make decisions about their daily lives, and community connection is built through flows of information that fairly and accurately reflect the lived experiences of all community members. Importantly, governments rely on information providers to effectively distribute information through a community, and uh, even as a healthy news and information ecosystem, simultaneously holds government power to account. 
So I, I think we can see that in a healthy information ecosystem, which includes local news and journalism, but is a limit to it, there's more trust in communities, there's more social connection, people volunteer more, people vote more, et cetera. Generally, communities and individuals are more civically minded. Another way of putting this is that no matter what your first issue is, and many of us are, um, don't work in journalism specifically, and this is a trend in Canadian philanthropy, uh, our second issue should be journalism. And so in other words, journalism is foundational in a healthy information ecosystem to helping us achieve our larger goals. Put another way, we can't solve the climate, climate crisis, crisis unless we all agree that there is uh, a climate crisis. And the second reason I think that uh, BFC put forward this panel is that this is a real opportune and unique moment for journalism and philanthropy. As many of us are aware, journalism organizations are now able to apply for charitable status. This is new. So far, there are only two in Canada, La Presse here in Montreal and the Narwhal, uh, but we expect more to come online soon. And as this work progresses, it makes sense to prepare the landscape by building bridges and receptor capacity in journalism and philanthropy so that we learn how to work together. And finally, we see the Canadian philanthropic sector mobilizing. And there's an active group of funders who are working together. And I'll say a bit more about this at the end of the session, but if you want more information now, please just email me. I'll drop my email in the chat. And with that, I'm going to, pay, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. April Lingren who's gonna paint a picture of the local uh, news ecosystem here in Canada. April. Well, well thank you very much, Chad. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here to talk about uh, local journalism and, and philanthropy. Um, I have been looking at the challenges faced by local journalism since uh, I launched the Local News Research Project back in 2008 um, at Ryerson's uh, School of Journalism or X University as um, we uh, now prefer to call it. Uh, while we're waiting for a name change. Um, I thought I could just provide in this uh, short moments, a few moments, a bit of context on why journalism merits support from the philanthropic sector and local journalism in particular. Uh, and I wanted to be clear about what I mean when I talk about journalism, because it has some basic characteristics that differentiate it from other types of information. So um, my checklist for what qualifies as journalism is that it's information that's been verified. It's independently produced. And by that, I mean, there is no um, uh, vested interest behind it. Um, it is timely and it is produced uh, using methods that are revealed and transparent to the audience. So um, audience people are aware of how that journalism is produced. And also it is uh, information that serves the, that is produced and serves the public interest. Um, as Chet mentioned, there's a growing body of research that demonstrates why journalism merits philanthropic support um, and, 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 and why I would argue it's part of the critical infrastructure of communities in the same way as hospitals, clean drinking water, and emergency response services. And I find that framing it that way often helps people better understand um, its significance. Um, I, I, I do want to make the point that philanthropic support for journalism, local journalism, is not about particularly saving the news industry. I mean, it's in trouble. And it is true that funds from philanthropy will uh, give local news uh, operations a more diversified revenue stream that will help them survive. But what foundation investments in uh, investments by foundations in, in journalism are is really about is um, funding community access to a steady supply of news that's essential to vibrant, well-functioning uh, places. Uh, as Chad mentioned, there's a really uh, growing body and rich body of research in the last 10 to 15 years demonstrating how and why uh, local journalism matters. Um, you know, obviously there's the issue of holding power accountable, uh, but this idea of community building, I just wanted to spend a minute on that uh, because it allows people to share vicariously in the events and life of the place where they live. So it might be as simple as uh, two neighbors having watched uh, a report on online or on on tv or read about it in the local paper about the candidate canada day fireworks and and having a chat about that and how good they were um more uh more more uh importantly well not importantly but another way of looking at this also is that um, local journalism equips people with the information they need to work together to solve common problems but also to become a part of and influence local decision making and the example I like to use of this has to do with um, an example of 
let's say there are plans to build a four lane highway at the end of your street. So having that information um, gives you a much better chance of being able to have a say in the matter because in the absence of local reporting, the chances are you might wake up one day to see the bulldozers starting work. Um, and you wouldn't have had a chance to participate in the committee meetings and the decision making process leading up to that point. Uh, so that's how it, it helps people participate in politics. Um, or in political decisions. Um, incumbents are more likely to be reelected in places um, where there are weak local news ecosystems. Voters are less likely to vote. And importantly, the vacuum that's created by the loss of local journalism creates a void. And into that void jumps increasingly, we're seeing vested interests, rumor and misinformation. Um, but at the same time, as we've started to better understand the importance of local journalism, it also has uh, obviously run into serious trouble. In 2008, the recession I use as a turning point because it's when advertising revenues plummeted, the internet and mobile uh, devices disrupted information delivery, and major platforms like Google and Facebook began vacuuming up increasingly scarce advertising do dollars. So I run a project called the Local News Map, and it's a, a, um, a, a crowdsource uh, tool for tracking uh, what's opening and what's closing at the local level in terms of local news organizations. And what we have on the map in terms of data now, as of October 1st, shows that 450 news operations have closed in 324 places across Canada. So, um, of course, that's only you need context for that. And, and the context is that while 450 um, organizations have closed, 173 have launched over the same period in 124 periods. So there's a significant shortfall in terms of the choices and options people have available for their um, for their information sources. The pandemic has just um, accelerated the challenges. Uh, 64 news outlets have permanently uh, closed since the pandemic uh, was declared. So just, I don't have a future in terms of the crystal ball, but I think there's actually more trouble ahead. Statistics Canada just issued a report showing that the revenue uh, of newspaper publishers dropped 22% or $600 million between 2018 and 2020. And I think there's great uncertainty in the next six months to a year about what's going to happen to balance sheets um, at privately operated news organizations now that the uh, federal government's uh, wage subsidy program is winding down. We don't know what the uh, numbers show for obviously privately held organizations, but Post Media reported receiving $23 million through these wage subsidies for the year, uh, for the last year. Uh, and that's when net earnings were 33 million. So I think there's a significant, um, uh, there's potentially a lot of trouble ahead, I think as, as that money disappears. So for all the reasons I just mentioned, I think there's a substantial need uh, for philanthropy to support journalism. And I'll just conclude by making the argument that um, um, one reason is that uh, local journalism and reporting done well contributes to the success of other philanthropic endeavors. As an example, reporting on the situation of homeless people in a city or town has the potential to create empathy and support for this group, alerts community members to the needs in their midst, and can spark conversations about solutions, all of which can benefit a funded project that aims to address the plight of people who have no access to shelter. So I'll just stop there. I hope I didn't go over my five minutes. No, that, that was wonderful, April. Thank you. Um, I think I wasn't looking at the clock specifically, but I think I'm going to say you were just perfect on five minutes. Um, I, let's, I'm going to hand it uh, directly over to Sadia. Thank you so much, Chad, and thank you so much, April. I'm a huge, huge supporter of April's work and, and the importance of it. Um, I'm going to come at this slightly differently. Um, our concern as a foundation is about narrative power. Those local outlets, many of those who are shuttered, never represented us or our issues. And so when I speak about this issue, I prefer to look at it from a content desert perspective as opposed to a news desert perspective. Content deserts are areas where the content is actually not truly reflective of the issues that are happening within the community, and it does not actually frame the issues in a way that is helpful to communities because the editorial framing does not include us. It does not include people of color. It does not include indigenous people. And therefore there is actually a huge power imbalance in terms of the narratives you hear and who is framing those narratives. If the last two years have 
taught us anything. Uh, look at what happened um, after the images of George Floyd's murder uh, circulated around the globe. Um, the demand within um, narrative, anybody who produces narratives, whether it's through journalism, feature films, you name it, anything that's a narrative book, um, for more representation and framing led by those folks who are actually at the heart of communities is, is a really, really important way forward in terms of the information ecosystem in Canada. We can't go back to the way it was, and we should never want to go back to the way it was, because the way it was, um, you know, framed our issues in a way that were disingenuous, uh, um, also did not uh, see us as subject matter experts. Um, in uh, a profession where objectivity is defined primarily by, by folks who are involved in Wall Street or Bay Street in this case, not necessarily the folks who are on Main Street and who are the folks who have the expertise. Um, so traditionally, we've looked at certain people as having kind of expertise and that kind of expertise is seen to be objective. This is a very important point because when we think about what has traditionally been seen as objective, those of us of color uh, are often seen just by mere virtue of who we are to have some sort of an agenda. So as we move forward into funding ecosystems and local projects and so on, we have to fundamentally blow up this notion of um, objectivity that does not include editorial, um, you know, in editorial framing by people who are from communities not normally making editorial decisions. This is significant because as April mentioned, this affects everything from local politics. It affects- uh, Sadia, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm, I'm being asked to ask if you can move your microphone a bit closer sure, to Sure, yeah, I will do that. Okay. Thank Apologies. you so thank much. You. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I've lost my train of thought a little bit, but it is really important because uh, the things that April mentioned uh, in terms of what is happening in your community and your ability to participate in civic life is crucial. It's a crucial function of journalism, um, but it is also very crucial that the issues that you hear about are also issues that are sit at the heart uh, uh, in terms of our ability to belong in a community. One of the challenges uh, for journalism moving forward um, in this country is that we are trying to look at what has been traditionally been a for-profit endeavor. And um, we are trying to put it into a box that is kind of like a charitable box. And while we have the green light now to do that under, under the new CRA rules, it is also an uncomfortable place for uh, philanthropy. And um, I think part of this is also we have very little experience at it. Uh, when I'm with the funders from the US, they are much, much further ahead on this and have been able to deal with, with the, the, these notions of kind of objectivity um, as well as uh, editorial interference, which is like a holy grail of journalism. But advertisers have always had influence. So, you know, so, so it, to say that philanthropy would influence content that is, is kind of an interesting, um, it's, it's an interesting uh, narrative uh, because I have certainly been in a position where advertisers have had undue influence over content and content has been pulled. Um, so, so I think that there, there are notions that the American uh, funders um, have worked through and are further ahead. And in this country, I think we're still grappling with this. Um, but the bottom line, there is no equity without a narrative power. We know how powerful narratives are. We know how they shape our, the perception that people have of us. They shape policy. They shape, uh, they shape our sense of what is possible in the world. And uh, just a really, really important place for us to be uh, in terms of philanthropy in this country. Wonderful. Thank you, Sadia. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, which I see. Thank you for those. Uh, we will get to them in a moment, but first we'll hand it over to Christophe Tenoir. Uh, Christophe, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Vous savez, je, je m'occupe de Reporters sans frontières, RSF, qui est une organisation qui défend les journalistes dans l'ensemble du monde et qui a fait le choix dans un moment d'explosion de la communication 
de défendre une vision exigeante du journalisme, une vision forte avec les droits et les devoirs des journalistes, en insistant sur l'éthique professionnelle, sur les méthodes, dans un moment où finalement tout le monde peut se revendiquer journaliste, et dans un moment où, pour la première fois dans l'histoire des démocraties, les, le journalisme, la propagande d'État, la publicité, la rumeur, les insultes, les propos de haine, tout ça se trouve en concurrence directe du fait de, du fonctionnement des plateformes numériques et des réseaux sociaux. Et disons-le clairement, c'est totalement destructeur pour les démocraties. Et ça peut tuer les démocraties. Il y a des prédateurs de la liberté de la presse qui tuent les journalistes. Les plateformes tuent le journalisme et peu à peu euh, portent atteinte aux démocraties. Et donc à RSF, on s'est dit, mais nous, on défend euh, les meilleurs joueurs, ceux qui incarnent les idéaux du journalisme. Mais ça ne suffit pas de défendre les meilleurs joueurs, il faut s'intéresser aussi aux règles du jeu. Et les règles du jeu, elles dépassent le journalisme. En fait, les règles du jeu, c'est celle de la délibération démocratique. Et ces règles du jeu, autrefois, elles étaient imposées par les parlements démocratiques. Et aujourd'hui, elles sont imposées par les dirigeants des plateformes numériques, disons Mark Zuckerberg d'un côté, et de l'autre par euh, des régimes autoritaires qui essaient d'imposer leurs normes, leurs lois au niveau international, les régimes despotiques. Et donc on s'est dit, il faut trouver les moyens de redonner aux démocraties la capacité d'imposer leurs normes euh, à ces plateformes qui prennent des décisions, euh, qui retirent, euh, qui censurent, qui décident de ce qu'on voit et ce qu'on ne voit pas, euh, qui prennent parfois des décisions totalement éditoriales pour 3 milliards de personnes. Et donc on a lancé deux initiatives que je vais décrire très brièvement. Une, oui, il s'est agi d'aller mobiliser les États pour leur dire... On est une organisation de taille moyenne de la société civile, mais on voit bien que les parlements aujourd'hui ne savent pas comment s'y prendre. Et donc, on va vous aider à répondre aux problèmes les plus compliqués d'aujourd'hui, ceux où on voit bien qu'il faut inventer du droit et où pour ça, il y a besoin d'organiser des groupes de travail partout dans le monde. Et on a lancé une initiative qui s'appelle l'initiative sur l'information et la démocratie, qui a donné lieu à un partenariat avec 43 États. Je me souviens au tout début l'un des premiers dirigeants qu'on avait tenté de convaincre et qui était venu, c'était le Premier ministre canadien, Trudeau. On l'avait fait avec d'autres. Et on a fait des recommandations très concrètes. Et on est en train de faire, pour le chaos informationnel, pour la démocratie, un peu l'équivalent de ce qui existe pour le climat, c'est-à-dire des sommets réguliers des États. On a obtenu ça. La création de l'équivalent du GIEC, le groupe d'experts sur le climat, on va créer l'Observatoire sur l'information et la démocratie. Et puis, on fait des propositions avec des engagements des États. La seule différence avec le climat, c'est qu'évidemment, il faut aller chercher une coalition multilatérale qui n'inclut pas les États despotiques. Ça, c'est la grande différence avec le climat. Et puis, on a lancé une autre initiative qui allait plus spécifiquement sur le journalisme. La première, c'était sur les garanties démocratiques dans l'espace public, qui est comment, donc cette seconde initiative, comment on on redonne un avantage à ceux qui euh, s'imposent des obligations en termes d'éthique et de méthode professionnelle. Alors qu'aujourd'hui, ils sont désavantagés et que la pression concurrentielle, elle abaisse les contenus partout et qu'il y a un risque de disparition du journalisme ou de dégradation de la qualité du journalisme. Et pour ça, on a essayé de trouver des choses qui, pour une ONG, étaient euh, assez originales, je crois. Euh, on a utilisé euh, une logique qui, d'habitude, est en, utilisée dans des secteurs de l'économie, qui est la normalisation standardization en anglais, au sens ISO du terme. Et on a travaillé avec euh, des médias partout dans le monde, y compris des médias canadiens. D'ailleurs, on a euh, un représentant au Canada qui est Michel Cormier, qui dirigeait l'information euh, à Radio-Canada. On travaille à un mécanisme de, de, de conformité, euh, conformity assessment, euh, fondé sur le marché de la certification, et qui nous permet ensuite de négocier avec les plateformes numériques, avec les annonceurs, avec les philanthropes, avec les agences de développement, avec les organes de régulation, des formes d'avantages pour les médias qui répondent à des obligations. Et l'enjeu, c'est de favoriser non pas une industrie, non pas une corporation, les journalistes, mais de favoriser le droit à l'information de tous les citoyens, êtres humains, acteurs économiques, en tant que citoyens, en tant qu'êtres humains, en tant qu'acteurs économiques, si on n'a pas accès à une information fiable, évidemment, euh, nos droits sont lésés et donc on est dans une forme de reconstruction, de défense de la fonction journalistique elle-même 
euh, au-delà de la défense des journalistes lorsqu'ils sont, lorsque leurs droits sont violés. Et je dois dire, et je crois que c'est l'objet de, de la suite de cette table ronde, mais que sur la question de ces changements systémiques qui sont invisibles, parce que les systèmes ne sont pas visibles, euh, la philanthropie a un très grand rôle à jouer. En gros, euh, selon le dicton du poisson, euh, il ne suffit pas de donner du poisson aux gens, mais il ne suffit pas non plus toujours de leur apprendre à pêcher. Il faut aussi travailler sur les règles de la pêche qui font qu'il y a encore du poisson à pêcher dans la mer. On travaille sur ces structures invisibles, ces infrastructures, euh, mais euh, la démocratie repose là-dessus. Super. Merci, Tristan. Euh, c'est toujours pratique euh, d'avoir une perspective internationale, donc ça nous aide beaucoup. Vraiment, merci beaucoup d'être ici avec nous euh, aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, on a, we have a moment for uh, a Q&A. There's a couple of questions that have been dropped in the chat box, and I confess, I don't know if someone can guide me. I don't know if it's just me that sees them or if everybody sees them. So if somebody could signal that to me, that would be appreciated. Um, uh, But what I, the, the one question is, uh, April, somebody has asked if you could verify, I, I have to read them aloud. Okay, great, thanks, Romina. Okay, so uh, April, somebody is asking if you could verify the stat. Um, the stat can shows that revenue of newspapers have dropped. I think they're asking for the source. So if you could maybe drop that in the chat. That would be appreciated. Oh, I think I, I think I misspoke, Chad. That was the issue. It was a Statistics Canada report, and it was a drop of 600 million. Uh, anyway, uh, 600 million. Um, I'll see if I can find the link and pop it into the chat. Okay, that's super helpful. Thanks, April. Uh, 600, 600 million between 2018 and uh, 2020 for news okay. for the newspaper sector. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, we're getting a thank you uh, in the chat box, so that's perfect. Uh, great. And then um, somebody's saying, asking about with uh, only La Presse and the Walrus, and actually the Narwhal as well, holding charitable status and profitability dropping within for profits. Where do you see philanthropic <coughs> dollars reaching journalism in this challenging market? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to look at the panelists, but maybe if I might, what I would quickly say, uh, my own experience with that is um, I, I think those of us who are working in the journalism space and philanthropy have definitely experienced a reluctance, if not somewhat an apprehension around funding journalism and a fear of trying to boil the ocean. Um, and that the problem is so vast that in comparison, the resources of philanthropy can be quite limited. And I think we're seeing some really innovative responses and Sadia mentioned some of the work that's going on in the United States. But a, a few things that we would mention that, that we're seeing to I think great success is trying to fund infrastructure supports, right? So things like business model support, things of that nature, funding very local. Um, ultimately, uh, journalism can be very local and needs to be very local. So funding quite local work and also funding um, Uh, sector initiatives that are supporting an entire sector to move forward. So there's an organization called IndieGraph that puts into place supports that multiple organizations can use, you know, Press Forward, which is an association of independent media associations. So rather than, uh, you know, targeted to one organization where they're going to be like, okay, well, now we need the funding the next year because the revenue is dropping. And so that might not align with our uh, philanthropic um, practicalities. There are other supports that it can be less open-ended and support the entire sector uh, in lifting up. I see Sadia nodding, which I appreciate. Um, yeah, no, I was, yeah. I was going to add to that, that that Please. is absolutely, um, we, uh, Chad, you and I have worked very closely on some of these things, and there is definitely, we're learning some very important things, and the infrastructure piece is really, really important. Um, One of the ways that we're going at that particular uh, that particular issue is that we are trying to uh, fund a number of independent um, kind of publications that are run within communities by uh, community leadership. And these are all BIPOC initiatives because we are not interested in the journalism uh, landscape writ large. We are very hyper-focused on uh, BIPOC leadership um, and editorial framing that actually allows some of those other voices uh, to take part in the information ecosystem. And so we've been funding a number of those initiatives over the last uh, 18 months for sure. And we're starting to see like some of them are actually going to have legs and some won't. 
but we're starting to see uh, see see some some very interesting things in terms of community response, in terms of civic engagement, in terms of uh, communities feeling validated. Uh, recognizing themselves in the media coverage. These are very, very crucial, crucial parts of the information ecosystem as well, and fundamental to justice, right? If we, if we think about journalism as a civic um, function that holds the powerful to account, this is a fundamental part of that accountability. So um, one of the, the things that we're running ourselves, uh, because there is no infrastructure and nobody is doing it, um, is something called uh, the Narrative Change Lab. And for the very first, for the iteration of this, that for the pilot of this, um, we are focused on uh, Muslim narratives in Canada. Some of you may know that the, Canada is the G7 country with the highest rate of targeted killings of Muslims. If this isn't a stat that should be on the front pages of everything and you know, um, be part of so many different discussions in this country. I, I don't know what else would be right at this moment. There are lots of other issues that are also very, very important. But we we are noticing that that the ecosystem does not support narratives that actually look at Islamophobia in any meaningful way. So uh, the Narrative Change Lab is part of the our kind of pilot into how can we kind how can we start to build some infrastructure that will actually allow the creation of narratives, but more importantly, the amplification of those narratives. And because we know the audiences for those narratives exist, it's just that they've never uh, been seen to be important. Um, and so we're trying to, trying to, it's a pilot. We don't know how it's going to go. We're trying to pull this together. And I, I will also drop a link into, into the chat uh, about um, the Narrative Change Lab. Um, but that's how we're going at this for-profit, not-for-profit piece. Um, we've been able to work, find trustees for those who do not have for, you know, not-for-profit status or charitable status. Um, and so far, we haven't run into too many problems. It's been surprisingly easy. Um, I, 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 this, the issue of, you know, how to make the most of limited resources, you know, there's, there's more than, um, 300 nonprofits in the United States and a lot of ex experience on funding um, news organizations there compared to Canada. But one of the emerging trends has been for community foundations to play a greater role through collaboration with, uh, through acting as a, a kind of a clearinghouse for funds where they collect funds that then can be used um, from, from within the community that can then be used to support local journalism um, and, and the priorities that they see in terms of wanting to support and build a stronger local news uh, system. Um, and I think one of the things, this is to Sadia's point, is about the diversity piece of, of, of this um, uh, puzzle. I mean, news organizations have been terrible about uh, changing uh, how they look, basically, and, and who works there. And they're also uh, really... Uh, not all that cooperative in terms of trying to do any sorts of diversity audits, especially at larger news organizations. I think they're getting a little bit better because they're under so much pressure, pressure to do so. Um, but I'm, I'm working actually on a report and have been for a year or so, uh, more than a year now, but it's been delayed, um, on, on the role of philanthropy and journalism in Canada, because we're just so much at the start of this process. And one of the recommendations we're looking at, and it's, I mean, it's, I don't think I'm telling foundations anything, is to, when you're looking to fund a news organization, and this would work for, you know, this community foundation initiative is to ask, you know, how, what is the, what is the makeup of the newsroom? Um, and to put pressure on news organizations directly through the funding process. Um, and secondly, to also make sure that any grants that are provided, provide uh, decent pay for the journalists that you're at the, the positions that you're funding so that so that people from diverse backgrounds can afford to be journalists and and be out there and 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 report on what's going on in their communities and I think that that's a really important one is that um, you know low pay either people just won't do it or can't and or can, more often can't do it if they don't have other other sources of support so I think that's something that really needs to be top of mind. I would just add to that, April, that it's a, it actually the, the issue is not at the entry level or even at the mid level. It is at the editorial level. Um, so until we actually really, really attack that problem head on in terms of editorial framing, uh, it's very hard. How many years of programs, entry level programs, mid level programs have we seen with no change, no change whatsoever? 
So just think that it's really important that we recognize that power is concentrated at editorial decision making level. Yeah, and but also that there's a, I mean, there's an ability to to work in those jobs that are paying minimally. I think I think is 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 a huge problem, uh, and and with the layoffs that we're seeing in the last round and in the pandemic, uh, but just before the pandemic and during the pandemic, um, a lot of, uh, for instance, HuffPost Canada uh, died, and there were a lot of young journalists of color working there who, you know, like these, they're the first, last in, first out kind of scenarios, and so you end up. Um, with a reinforce, re reinforcing the, the the trends of the last you know forever years, um, with with newsrooms being basically very white. Thank, thank you. Um, a, a few quick things, Sally. There's a question for you, but just before we get to that, um, just a quick reminder for all panelists: if we could speak just a bit slower for for the interpretation, that would be extremely helpful. Um, April, I remember you at a meeting writing seven or 11 things philanthropy can do to support journalism. And I know I have a picture of it somewhere and I was trying to look for it and I couldn't find it. But if you have that somewhere, I think that would be really helpful. And, and if, you could, if you could post it or send, or send it afterwards, I think folks would really like to see it. And then I just wanna quickly share as well a resource. So the Atkinson Foundation, I don't know if they're on this call or this webinar conference session, um, but one of the leaders in, in supporting journalism in Canada via their uh, their um, their efforts to support um, a healthy labor uh, ecosystem, and um, they supported a work in wealth beat at the Toronto Star. And if you click on that link and scroll down to the second paragraph, there's a link that says more background information about this project is available here. And what comes up is a wonderful four pager on how to work with a mainstream news outlet. And it speaks to issues of editorial integrity. It's, it's such a helpful document and it's an incredibly reassuring document for organizations that are, are worried you know, about, about those, some of those lines uh, that, that we've been talking about. So I just, I really wanted to, to share that. Um, okay, so Sadia, a question for you. And then Christoph, we've got a question for you afterwards. Um, so Sadia, if you could tell us a bit more about the Narrative Change Lab. Were you inspired by other initiatives of the same type in other parts of the world? And if so, what was the impact of such initiatives? And thank you for the question. Yes, and that this is an excellent question. Uh, we spent six months researching all over the world, actually, on uh, initiatives like that, that were actually trying to do what we were trying to do. We came up with virtually nothing. Uh, there was one organization in the US called the Pillars Fund that, that ran a, a much smaller version of a lab. So we're really work, uh, looking at some of their learnings. Um, they were not focused so much on journalism as well as other forms of narrative. All narratives are important in, in the ecosystem, uh, regardless of the platform that they come in and the way that they come, come to us, right? They still shape our, our perceptions of who our neighbors are and who we are. Um, so, so we've just finished the, the, the kind of research uh, portion of, of, of that work. And now we're moving into in early in the new year to actually putting together a cohort of Muslims, Muslim content creators in Canada to bring together uh, about a dozen people to in a way have a brain trust that could help us figure out the best, um, I guess, pathways into influencing the information ecosystem. And how, how do we do that? And because nothing exists, we're hoping that out of that kind of lab cohort, there will be some tangible projects that we can actually then support and move out of you know, our office in terms of programming and out into the community. But we really had to um, start with putting in the infrastructure ourselves because it, it, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. So it's a pilot. I have no idea what will happen uh, you know, once, once this, this cohort gets together and what they will, you know, in terms of their ideas and their thoughts and their, um, their experiences around this, what they will actually determine are the best ways to get information. In. I, I mean, I have some ideas just because of my background in, in journalism, but I don't know what will come out of that cohort. And so that's where we are. I hope I hope that's helpful. And so yes, and don't have any learnings yet 
from anywhere else in the world. Uh, the Pillars Fund actually did put out, uh, um, they didn't uh, share this publicly, but just their internal learning. So we're, we're taking a close look at that and we're, you know, and talking to them quite a lot. They were also just very, very uh, successful in starting a fellowship uh, with um, Hollywood uh, Studios to actually make sure uh, that that the narratives, uh, in this case also around Muslim representation, were accurate and fair. And this is a huge, huge step forward because you have all seen all the movies around the trope of the terrorists, the woman who is enslaved, the woman who has no power within relationships, you know, Muslim women, all of those tropes, they have absolutely shaped, um, you know, shaped people's ideas of, of who Muslims are and um, have not at all uh, touched on the diversity of uh, Muslims globally, but also within within Canada. So some some really interesting things happening, but very nascent work. Very, we're just at the beginning of it. Great. Thanks, thanks, Sadia. And if I might say, like, this is also an interesting example. I think of something that philanthropy does quite well and is unique to philanthropy. Maybe not unique, but. Um, you know, supporting early stage innovation, helping to de-risk other work, prototyping, et cetera. You know, often, you know, in journalism space, I might say, well, why isn't government doing it or the private sector? Um, and this kind of work is something that um, those uh, entities might struggle with a little bit more than us, right? So we can be a bit more agile and uh, journalism certainly needs some agility uh, at this moment in time as it's reinventing itself. So there's a few more questions coming in. Thank you for those. Uh, Christophe, uh, this one is for you, but others might have thoughts on it too. Um, so uh, one person is wondering how the Canadian information ecosystem is perceived from abroad and is philanthropy support to the journalism trust initiative strong in other parts of the world and, and Canadian philanthropy. And I, I, I should maybe say here that you know, of course, there's two, at least two information ecosystems in Canada. There's an English one, and there's a French one, but there are multiple ones, but maybe just generally uh, the Canadian information uh, ecosystem. En fait, c'est nous sur toutes les initiatives que nous avons lancées, on, on a travaillé avec des parties prenantes canadiennes. Et il y a une chose qui est perceptible de l'étranger, et je le dis pas pour vous faire plaisir, c'est que il euh, y a beaucoup d'initiatives au Canada. Je pense à des initiatives euh, public euh, sur la régulation des plateformes numériques, euh, je pense au groupe de travail sur la diversité des contenus, au financement du journalisme, et, et je vous assure que euh, l'intensité euh, des engagements en matière de financement public du journalisme au Canada, euh, je ne suis pas certain que je sois capable de citer, euh, euh, peut-être y a-t-il quelques pays européens, mais un, un tel engagement. Et puis, s'agissant euh, des initiatives, euh, disons, de la société civile, on, on sent aussi euh, une très grande euh, intensité. J'avais une réunion tout à l'heure, par exemple, du, du forum sur l'information et la démocratie que nous avons créé. Euh, on, on travaille de manière euh, très proche avec CIGI, euh, euh, C-I-G-I, euh, qui est une organisation canadienne euh, renommée. Euh, il y a peu de réunions, on ne travaille pas avec des, des, des Canadiens. Et peut-être parce que vous êtes à cheval sur euh, plusieurs mondes et que le Canada est un, est un pays original de ce point de vue-là. Et, euh, et, et nous, pour nous, je, encore une fois, je ne le dis pas pour vous faire plaisir, euh, je ne le dis pas par intérêt, mais il euh, euh, y a une compréhension intime sur ces euh, questions euh, structurelles, sur euh, cet enjeu de sauver le journalisme, qui est assez différent, par exemple, de ce qui peut être fait... Euh, euh, aux États-Unis, me semble-t-il. Et s'agissant du, du, du rôle de la philanthropie, c'est vrai que ça peut... En fait, plus les initiatives sont ambitieuses, euh, là, par exemple, on, on va travailler avec des États, on allait chercher des États, euh, on travaille avec euh, l'Association mondiale des annonceurs, euh, on s'adresse aux plateformes numériques. Donc, plus les initiatives sont ambitieuses comme ça, plus la réaction de la philanthropie peut être de se dire mais euh, tout ça est très large, euh, tout ça euh, est sans doute euh, l'objet de soutien public important. Et en fait, ce n'est pas tout à fait vrai. Et, et euh, moi, la faveur, ça fait maintenant dix ans que je travaille à Reporters sans frontières. 
Et quand on a lancé des projets, euh, je, je me rends compte que quand on veut changer le monde, en fait, il faut euh, essayer de provoquer des changements systémiques euh, auxquels je faisais référence tout à l'heure. Euh, il faut s'intéresser à l'organisation, euh, aux lois, au cadre juridique, au droit international, au droit national, à l'économie. Et il faut arriver à faire des liens entre euh, euh, des choses qui peuvent sembler très éloignées. Et par exemple, la Journalism Trust Initiative, c'est une initiative euh, qui parle du fonctionnement technologique, qui fait le lien avec euh, l'éthique journalistique et les méthodes professionnelles des journalistes, et avec l'économie des médias. Et donc souvent pour la philanthropie, c'est un peu... On se dit, mais ça touche à beaucoup de choses très différentes, ça n'entre pas dans une logique euh, très précise. Euh, et à mon sens, c'est une évolution que, à laquelle j'appelle, euh, c'est qu'il euh, y a une bonne articulation entre le soutien public, parce qu'il peut y avoir des formes de soutien public, notamment des agences de développement sur ces questions, euh, mais avec la philanthropie qui permet d'être agile, parce que paradoxalement, sur ces initiatives euh, où on va chercher des grands acteurs et où on est soi-même un petit acteur. On n'est rien par rapport aux États, par rapport aux plateformes numériques, par rapport au monde des annonceurs, mais on essaie de les mobiliser. Et pour ça, on a besoin d'une grande agilité et pour ça, la philanthropie, très clairement, a un rôle à jouer et on ne pourrait pas le faire sans, euh, sans le soutien euh, de mécènes ou de fondations euh, qui ont envie, de, à un moment crucial, euh, de défendre la démocratie de manière générale et à l'intérieur de la démocratie, un journalisme de qualité euh, qui est euh, un des moyens d'avoir un débat sur des bases euh, factuelles. Et, et, et c'est vrai que tous les sujets de la philanthropie, finalement, euh, que vous travaillez sur la corruption, sur les inégalités, euh, sur les questions de, de narratif, sur euh, les discriminations. Au fond, il y a besoin de, de bases factuelles, de journalisme de qualité. Et, euh, et pour ça, euh, euh, j'appelle vraiment à ce, ce qu'on puisse travailler ensemble. Un dernier point dont on a tiré beaucoup d'avantages du Canada, qui est la question de la doctrine. Et je... je vous l'assure, euh, en matière de doctrine sur l'évolution depuis l'évolution historique du droit, de la, de la liberté de la presse à l'origine, à l'accès à l'information, au droit à l'information, puis au droit à l'information fiable, quand nous avons lancé cette initiative avec euh, une commission sur l'information et la démocratie, nous avons beaucoup utilisé des penseurs canadiens, des intellectuels canadiens, des livres de journalistes canadiens qui avaient réfléchi sur ces questions et qui avaient une concep des conceptions très original, et c'est des choses euh, qu'on a beaucoup utilisées à l'origine de cette initiative. On a travaillé avec un certain nombre de, de prix Nobel, d'économie, de littérature, de, de, de la paix. Euh, je dois dire qu'on a notamment beaucoup travaillé avec euh, Maria Ressa, cette journaliste philippine qui vient d'avoir le prix Nobel de la paix, euh, et, et avec elle, on a beaucoup travaillé sur, euh, on s'est beaucoup inspiré de ces euh, intellectuels, de ces écrivains canadiens sur la doctrine du droit à l'information. Merci, Christophe. So someone's asking, what do you think are the main barriers for foundations supporting journalism in Canada, elsewhere? So, you know, I, the panelists might have some thoughts on that, but I, I have a feeling there's a lot of expertise around the room that others might have thoughts too. So I'm going to turn it over to the panelists and just raise your hand, but I'm also going to ask everybody if you have thoughts to drop it either in the chat box or to, to raise your hand. I think um, this is a really, really fundamental question. Um, one of the things that that I think is is um, is kind of interesting. Um, a lot of conversation around um, journalism in within the philanthropic sector uh, is actually a means to an end, right? It's a means to the climate crisis. It's a it's it's a way to kind of uh, talk about the issues that are important to whatever your mission happens to be uh, as a foundation. And I think this is really crucial. I think sometimes what gets uh, what makes people nervous is that journalism is a high risk activity, and foundations are very risk averse. 
Um, you know, journalists are targets of all sorts of things. Uh, information uh, that gets out there can challenge all kinds of systems. And um, I know that this is probably not a nice thing to say, but I think philanthropy is very, very cautious around not ruffling um, institutional powers. And I think that that's some of the caution that we have around journalism. Um, and also, I think there's this whole notion of these are, is, except for our state, uh, not our state, but our public broadcaster, um, this is traditionally a for-profit activity. And so I think that that's the other thing that people are grappling with, right? How do people need to be able to make a living uh, doing this work? They need to be able to build whatever it is that they're trying to build. And um, and that is all, all that is not always an, another not-for-profit or a charitable entity. Uh, so we're taking a function that is usually um, a for-profit function, except for our public broadcaster, and trying to put it in this box that is more like a charitable activity. And I think th those are just some of my observations around uh, philanthropy. Very, very different than philanthropy in the US, because uh, when, when I'm at those tables, they're, they're way past all of this. Like they've, they've worked through this and they're about a decade ahead, I think. If I could build uh, just on what Sadia said, it, in my experience, philanthropy to be, um, you know, blunt and direct, doesn't know how to support journalism. Um, and what I mean by that is we're quite used to, you know, supporting a food security project or, you know, where we understand the metrics and, and we know what success looks like. But because this work is new, um, we have a lot of work to do in our own capacity building in terms of understanding how to support journalism and figuring out together what, what successful journalism uh, partnership looks like. Um, and so, you know, the, the work that, that Sadia and others are, are doing to support that early stage work and that relationship building work, I, I think it will become foundational as together as sectors uh, over the course of the next few years, we learn how to better work together. Um, there, there's a bit of a lift, I think, that's still needed there. If I could jump in, uh, Chad, um, my list of 12 models for funding journalism, I think has grown to 16 or 18 now. It's kind of a mess, so I can't share it right now. Um, but in this report, what, that's one of the things we're going to outline or just kind of what the options are. And I think that that's also part of the dilemma, what's effective um, when you've got all these sorts of, sorts of options. Um, as part of this uh, research that we've been doing, we talked to about uh, 25 news organizations and um, uh, funders, uh, mostly in the United States. Um, and I just thought uh, a couple of things that have come out that might be of interest to, to the group is that um, one of the things is that patience is required um, because as, as one of the people at the foundations we talked to said, my board's fairly new to philanthropy in journalism. And, and I keep having to say to them over and over again, everything costs way more and takes way longer than you think it will or you think it should. So that, that was the first part, but also this need to understand who, who you're in effect kind of, I, I wanna say getting, it, getting involved with um, in terms of supporting journalism. Um, and, and one of our uh, uh, people we talked to um, from Solutions Journalism said, foundations and their boards of directors um, aren't going to like every headline. Um, they, they might not like the choices a newsroom makes on what to investigate, but they can't dictate uh, coverage. And, you know, just as a third example, um, the main thing uh, we were told is making sure everyone has the same understanding and expectations from the start. So we were really clear with folks that we approach about funding us about how we work. If we write a story, you don't like it, you're just going to have to deal with it. And I think that might go a long way towards also explaining to people, helping to explain some of the discomfort and anxiety associated with it. Thank you, April. So um, I'm, I'm just going to mention that there is this question. I don't know if we'll have time. I don't think we have time to answer it. Uh, the question is, what are good international practices to encourage greater diversity of evidence-based narratives and protect editorial independence? So uh, the question I think is identifying a, an important tension there. So maybe if it's all right with everybody, we'll just quickly do a go around of any closing thoughts and we'll do it in reverse order. Um, so please continue and complete the question. Okay, so I think we might go a little bit past the hour then. The session does end at 15 minutes past the hour. That's great, so we've got some time. 
apologies. Um, the, the, you know, the real time <laughs> transparent uh, facilitation. So I'm going to repeat the question. If folks have an, an answer to that, uh, that's great. And then as we're doing that, we'll also do the go around. Uh, any closing thoughts? And then just so everybody knows, we'll start with Christophe, we'll go to Sadia, and then we'll end uh, on, on April. So the question was, uh, what are good international practices, if you know of any, of course, um, to encourage greater diversity of evidence-based narratives and to protect editorial independence? Il y a quelques années, à Reporters sans frontières, nous avions publié un rapport qui s'appelait Média, les oligarques font leur shopping. En constatant que c'était malheureusement un, un phénomène mondial, qu'on voyait que des groupes industriels, des hommes d'affaires, rachètent des médias pour les asservir à leurs intérêts dans des logiques d'influence ou pour servir les intérêts du pouvoir. Et qu'il faut mettre fin à ça parce qu'on arrive à une forme de corruption de l'information, disons-le, de capture de l'information, d'achat de l'information. Les méthodes, quelles sont-elles Un, euh, faire en sorte qu'il y ait l'adoption de lois euh, dans les différents pays, au nord comme au sud, euh, permettant de garantir l'indépendance éditoriale des médias. Deux, trouver des mécanismes qui permettent que lorsqu'il y a de l'indépendance éditoriale, et qu'on est en mesure de le prouver, euh, pas simplement comme une affirmation, on bénéficie davantage et qu'on remonte. Euh, on remonte euh, dans les algorithmes on remonte dans les financements des annonceurs, etc. Donc ça, par exemple, c'est exactement l'un des sujets traités par la Journalism Trust Initiative, qui vise à établir de la transparence sur la propriété, sur le fonctionnement interne, et précisément sur cette question de l'indépendance éditoriale. Parce que l'indépendance éditoriale, c'est une bonne question pour la fin, parce qu'en fait, c'est tout l'enjeu. Aujourd'hui, on est confronté à deux options. Soit on va aller vers un monde où il y aura des diversités de lignes éditoriales, de contenus, mais à chaque fois, ça sera pour servir les intérêts de quelqu'un ou d'un groupe industriel, intérêts euh, cachés ou pas. Ou alors, on va vers un monde où il y a des diversités de lignes éditoriales, de vision du monde, de conception, avec une recherche factuelle euh, dans le cadre de ces lignes éditoriales, mais qui sont dégagés de conflits d'intérêts, dégagés euh, d'interférences. Et c'est évidemment, si on veut servir la, la liberté d'opinion et d'expression, cette seconde voie qu'il faut emprunter, et donc il faut trouver euh, là des méthodes. Et puis, par ailleurs, je suis dit, il y a euh, l'éducation, euh, la formation des différentes euh, euh, rédactions, et, et notre Journalism Trust Initiative, on a constitué un consortium avec des organisations de développement média qui travaillent dans l'ensemble des pays du Sud, et qui vont travailler concrètement dans les médias pour essayer de leur faire améliorer leur processus interne et les garanties sur ces questions. Merci Christophe. Sadia, closing thoughts and any thoughts on the question? Yes, um, thank you Christophe. That was the, 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 the whole notion of uh, the buying of publications by philanthropists uh, to, to kind of forward their own names uh, surfaced actually quite recently in, in a meeting of American funders and uh, a counter, counter movement of other philanthropists now trying to buy up other publications uh, because of the, the, the right wing skew of, of some of these um, some of these other publications and how and the effect that that's happening on the information ecosystem it's quite significant and especially in lead up to another American election. So it's a real, I, I, I really appreciate you outlining that as a big issue uh, for, for independence and also for, uh, for, for transparency. Um, I would say that um, the, the, the question around editorial independence is not a particularly difficult one. It can easily be solved with an MOU that simply states that you have no editorial, like you have no editorial control. Um, and for, for grant makers who are already um, working a lot with unrestricted grants, where we don't tell anybody uh, what they will do with, with their grants, they, they, they put through a proposal of what they'd like to do. But, you know, if, if it fits within our mission, our, our vision and, and so on, is, and uh, we, we would never interfere anyways. 
Um, so journalism is another space where that interference is actually even more important to respect. Um, and I, I guess maybe partly for me, um, because my background is, is in journalism and uh, I reported for so many years, it seems like a fairly obvious thing that editorial independence is really, really important. And I will also say this in the context of another publication that we helped fund, uh, which is Indigenous out of uh, Kelowna and uh, Vancouver Island. Their um, editorial independence when uh, the unmarked graves were found at many different residential schools was significant because it was not at all what legacy media was doing. And I think that when we talk about editorial independence, we also have to include that kind of independence, which essentially was about staying silent and saying nothing. And that is also editorial independence. So I think that we need to respect all forms of editorial independence um, when, we, when we talk about that issue, but it's not hard to do. Thank you for that, Sadia. Uh, well, I was gonna make the point that Sadia did, which is the, the need for, for uh, agreements so that everybody knows the rules of the game. Um, some research that was done in the States, they actually surveyed um, the number, news, news organizations that were funded by, by um, um, donors, uh, foundations. I, I can't remember if they surveyed both or one of them anyway, but they found actually they were used much less frequently than you think they should be, that, or that, that you think they would be. So I think they are kind of, they, they are should and become a best practice. And I think in Canada, we have the opportunity to learn very much from the mistakes and, 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 and great ideas that are available um, and have been tried south of the border where there's been much more work uh, in terms of philanthropic support for journalism. Um, so that's one of the things we're trying to distill for um, uh, the work that we're doing now um, is to take those best practices and, and, and make them available to both funders and to um, to news organizations. And uh, just one final thought on the idea of, of influence is, and, and I don't think this one has been solved, is that simply making money available for a project, one project versus another is, is a form of influence. So you decide that you're going to fund, um, I don't say, say it's a project specific uh, uh, support for a, a, a series of story, uh, climate change reporting versus uh, health reporting versus uh, the challenges of the opioid crisis. Those versus, um, you know, promoting local business, uh, sort of the local business environment or better coverage of local business. Those are all actually choices that are made at the foundation level. And I'm not actually sure what the solution to, to that one is, um, but it is, uh, I think we need to be conscious that it's a, it's a form of, um, it is a form of, uh, of influence, influencing the agenda. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that, April, because if, uh, if Community X is coming to us and saying, the most important thing that is that we need to cover at this moment is hate directed at us. And we say, yes, that's a fabulous project. I don't see that as a form of influence. Uh, this is arising from within the community. Yes. And so, so, I, so I just want to- Yeah, that, that, that would be the exception. I was thinking more in terms of sort of a top down this decision about what, what the priority of say a major fund, uh, I, I, it probably applies more to private funders, individual funders. But uh, but I was thinking more in terms of sort of a top down, like we've decided we want to fund this. Who's who's who, who's out there that would do it? But I totally take your point. Yes, if it's coming from the community, very different situation. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes. I just dropped a note in the chat that we do have time for one more question. And as we see if one is out there, maybe I'll just quickly say, um, you know, so as I think we've seen over the last hour. This is a, a, a definitely growing field uh, in Canada. We're seeing the need go up and I, I think we are seeing philanthropy respond. And I, I wanna highlight a few opportunities for those that might be interested in, in taking a deeper dive into this work. There is a group of Canadian funders that have been meeting for the last few years, a funders affinity group, um, where uh, our objective is twofold. So one is uh, for all of us to, to learn together about how to work in this space. Um, and then the second objective is to identify uh, partnership opportunities. There's, so there's been a number of projects uh, where uh, we co-funded pieces of work. And so that of course has the great advantage of de-risking uh, where we might be a bit nervous and also adding more capital. 
So, you know, we've worked with uh, Team Spirit on Indigenous as well as other projects. You know, when COVID started, the group of funders came together to fund a mis and disinformation project, training journalists on how to track mis and disinformation and not spread it, uh, all sorts of things. So if anybody is interested, I can uh, help connect you to the group and I'll drop my email again in the chat, making sure to spell it correctly. Uh, that would be a pleasure. We're always looking for, for new members. Um, and with that, unless any of the panelists have any final thoughts or any questions, uh, I will thank everybody for their presence and participation and hand it back over to Ina. Thank you so much, Chad. And thank you so much, everyone, for a lovely discussion. A few takeaways. I do hope that everyone was as excited about the topic as I was. I have tons of notes with me to take away. Uh, thank you, April, for reminding us that it's not about saving the journalism. It's about funding community access to news and reliable news and how access to the story helps glue community and rally the community around issues. Thank you, Sajia, for reminding us about editorial framing and importance of having a voice and of whose voice we are reflecting. I'm really uh, excited about exploring more your narrative change lab. I'll definitely take it away and look into that. And thank you so much, Christoph, for reminding us about the importance of democratic deliberation and how important that is the democracy is to take the way back and then set the role on stage how that work is, is happening. Very exciting conversations. Have a lovely break, everyone, and see you soon.